So this is uh, quite interesting sort of policy-wise, because on the one hand, we have um, the sort of micro response to uh, shocks at the household level, but there's also the sort of macro story. Um, and to a degree, the, the two uh, policy-wise would meet up, because you would think about um, how you would try and buffer shocks at the macro level. I mean, Atanu mentioned uh, the accumulation of, uh, of reserves. But inevitably, some of these shocks get passed through to the microeconomy and initiate household responses. And then you need forms of social protection or whatever you're going to use to try and buffer them at the household level. But I, but I think the message in, in both papers, in both papers, is you're not going to get um, inclusive growth um, successfully in Africa unless you think uh, not only about the growth rate of African economies but also the variability. Of that, uh, of that growth rate and its impact for the national economies and households. Okay, so I'd like to um, uh, just put it out for any, uh, any questions and, um, and comments in the, in the 10 minutes or so that we, we have left. Uh, if you could identify yourself and um, say where you're from. So uh, if we could take uh, the uh, uh, young Fu first and then um, the gentleman uh, over there. Young Fu. Okay. Um, I'm Yongfu Huang uh, from UNU Wider. I have two questions for the first speaker and two questions for the second speaker. Um, <laughs> uh, for the first presentation, I think um, your presentation is very comprehensive, right? You have a critical model and, and empirical studies. But I'm afraid I just couldn't see the connection between your theoretical, theoretical section and empirical sections. I think this is likely because I didn't get your point. For you, theoretical sections, I, I think this is a typical business, business cycle model, right? But I just, I just didn't get a point <clears throat> how you model the shocks, right? Um, you look at the two kinds of shocks. One is income, income dimension and long income dimensions, right? Typically, we, we, we model the shocks to technology progress, shocks to capital, shocks to labels, right? But I didn't get a point. Could you give a details how you model the shocks? In terms of your, your empirical sections, um, because you only report one fillable, right, in one table, right? I think it would be good if you could report full, mo full model, because in you <coughs> in your theoretical section, you can see the um, label, capital, all kinds of assets, right? It would be good if you report, right, full model, right, includes all followables, with some kinds of, with some necessary um, statistics for at least R squares, so that we could have an idea, right, in terms of if the models are well specified. Otherwise, we can completely got no, uh, no idea about the model property. And if we compare the ordinary square in no fixed effect, right? And and I just because the coefficient actually yeah. the fixed okay. effect is supposed to be downward bias. If the sample, if the panel is short, but very often I see coefficient is larger than always. Right. Uh, Sorry for the second presentation. Actually, actually, I think what I'm going to do is, d does anybody have um, mm. questions as well on the first paper? Because uh, you're asking quite complex questions, and I, I fear. We're going to lose the logic of the argument. So, is this on the on the first paper? Yeah, let's take let's take the first paper actually, and and then you know we can get. I think we should do it that way because we're going to end up in a bit of a complex story. Yeah, it's a great presentation. I think you have raised one of the important issues uh, with regards to child labor and um, and the, the commodity commodity shocks. Mm, the question is on the proxy that you use for parental income. So there have been, if you look at the literature, there have been a lot of critics that uh, for those who are using the parental income uh, and uh, schooling, the parents' schooling. So could you please reflect on that if you have taken other measures also into account? And why fixed effects? Why did you use fixed effects? Okay, you, you always get two questions from wider staff members. So is this on the first paper, sir? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's the best way to do it. And then just, we're going to get raveled up otherwise. 
I am Stephen Kirama from the University of Dar es Salaam. My question is uh, exactly on the definition of uh, child labor in Tanzania. Because I know in the findings you really indicated like uh, child labor on agricultural activities. But essentially we have uh, quite significant uh, child labor when it comes to mining, especially in some regions. We have uh, child labor when it comes to Lake Victoria, which has been reported quite significantly. Now I would like to know the extent of the child labor definition that used to Tanzania to see if it really reflected what we understand is taking place back home. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So any further questions or comments on the first paper? Susanna, please just say who you are for the record. <laughs> I'm Susanna Sandstrom from Obo Academy University. Uh, this is just a thought. Um, I was wondering whether you could sort of uh, uh, further uh, specify the type of shocks into sort of uh, covariate and idiosyncratic uh, shocks because I think that households respond to shocks differently depending on, on if the whole community is affected or if it's a very household-specific shock. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Sina. Okay, so I think that's it on... No, no, yep, we have a further... Question on the first paper, please, sir. Thanks. Uh, Christophe Muller from uh, the University of Aix-Marseille, France. Uh, one issue with uh, uh, crop shocks is that they are, they are not uh, completely random. You know, they depend on the, on the specialization uh, decision of, of the household, on, on, the, on the organization of the, of the cultivation. Uh, which may involve uh, labor-intensive techniques. Sometimes, if you in Tanzania, if you choose to to have some association of crops, as it's often the case, you need to have all the family uh, getting involved in the work. So uh, maybe that there is a, a, an important degree of simultaneity between the the occurrence of the shock and the, on on the decision of uh, uh, involving the children in in, in the work. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that's a very rich set of questions for you, everything from estimation methods to the definition of child labor. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for the uh, comprehensive and uh, very elaborate uh, comments. Uh, some of the things, of course, we can answer now. Uh, other things, of course, we may have to uh, explore a little bit further. Uh, which we might not have uh, addressed properly. Uh, on the connection between the model and the estimation, uh, how do you model the shocks? Now, if you look at the model, <coughs> the, the shock is coming through the budget constraint. Uh, because uh, in, the, in the model we are using, we try to use the consumption smoothing model uh, in the uh, general literature we uh, have. The shocks is um, kind of random it enters the model through the budget constraint. Uh, usually, th there are literature which uses that way, and probably um, we may have to explore a little bit further as to whether it is random. But going back to the, say for example, the, uh, uh, the, some of the remarks I made, to see whether the shocks are random, uh, the period one shock has some uh, correlation with, uh, sorry, period two, shocks have some correlation with period one. So meaning it is not necessarily uh, random. But the reason we uh, wanted to go ahead with uh, was the, the magnitude was very small, uh, although it was ten, uh, significant at 10% level. So um, our initial assumption was that since it is very marginal, uh, it shouldn't cause uh, a serious issue. Um, only report one variable. Um, <clears throat> in fact, the reason why I just put uh, the particular variable that I am interested in is to minimize the number of slides. Uh, in the paper, we have full set of variables that we are using, uh, all control variables and uh, fixed uh, effects uh, to see what the levels are. But it is just uh, to uh, minimize the uh, time taken to uh, explain or go through and also the number of slides. Uh, proxy for parental income. Uh, here again, uh, we thought that uh, this is, um, um, as I explained, uh, one proxy we can, 
we could get out of the questionnaire uh, was the, um, um, the um, level of education. Uh, uh, the assumption here is that the, the higher uh, level of education will lead to uh, more income of the parents, the, uh, the higher probability of uh, earning more income. Um, so we have to go back to um, so the questionnaire and see whether there are other proxies, to, uh, whether we can use them. Um, definition of child labor. Um, now, in this model, we use schooling age child from age 7 to 15. Uh, now, they are involved in different types of working. Uh, say, for example, in this particular case, looking at also at the questionnaires, we can see working at home as household labor, uh, working in the field in agriculture, uh, working for wage labor. Three things we can get out of the questionnaires uh, on the type of work that uh, children use. So depending on how children respond, uh, whether you worked uh, during that particular period, in any of those, we take it as providing child labor. Um, spe specify the type of shocks. Now, I, I mentioned about two shocks. The income shock that we use here is any negative impact on the earnings on the cro uh, from crops. The question we particularly ask is whether uh, there is, uh, uh, say, due to floods or um, droughts or any pest control, whether that had an impact on the earnings from the crops, whether there is a failure of crops. On the non-income shock that we used uh, is the death of the immediate family member, specifically uh, we are looking at the mother or the father. Um, crop chops, I think I addressed that issue, crops of whether they are completely random uh, or not, uh, labor intensive techniques and uh, like that. Uh, again, it is the same explanation that I can give. Uh, it is the impact is very marginal, so we assume it is random. But given this, say for example, the limited time span, it's only two year gap, uh, it might also uh, have an impact on the results. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you, Ankara. Okay, so let's now take questions on the, uh, on the uh, second uh, paper. Um, could, it, could we take the, the gentleman the, um, in, the, in the blue uh, jacket hasn't spoken, so I'll take him first. So. Please, sir, could you identify yourself, say who you are? Uh, I, I'm Tomoke Fuji, Singapore Management University. Um, I found the presentation quite interesting, but uh, I wasn't clear about the price or price index that you have used. You mentioned that you know the price movement uh, differ across commodities. I, I, I wasn't quite clear whether you have uh, used raw price data for your analysis or some kind of price index? And uh, if uh, the latter is the case, would it be interesting to look at, uh, you know, the differential sort of shocks across different commodities? So different countries may well have, you know, different response to different commodities. Uh, I'm not quite sure if you have addressed. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so let's take Young Fu. Uh, if you could be brief. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Thanks for your presentation. And first question, and in, in your introduction, or oh, I find, oh, when you're talking about the, the Mock model in Hamilton model, I find it very interesting that you, you talk about the X plus term, right, X plus term, right? I find this is very interesting. Could you give some more details on that, especially the intuitions for this term? And secondly, um, you use the traditional far mode far approach to study country by country, like many countries. And, and, and as you know, the underlying assumption for this approach is that there is no correlation across country, right? There's no correlation, right? Countries are, are, are uncorrelated, right? However, those African countries are actually highly correlated because of the globalization and trade. Okay, so I wonder if you have ever considered using uh, PANOVA to study this group of countries in one go. 
right? Now you study one by one, right? I, I suppose if you, you use Panova to look at this in one go, you will, you will see the difference. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Yangfu. So we have Aziz. Could you use the microphone, Aziz? Uh, thank you very much, Atanu, for a very interesting study. So if I understood correctly, you have some countries who have positive impact on, on GDP or growth, and some countries have negative impact, right? That's so in, in the paper, did you discuss why? Why is it like that? Because you are now confusing the, uh, you know, people who are working on the area. Because the recent arguments were that it has a positive impact uh, on GDP. Now you find that, well, it's not necessarily the case. So why and so what's next? What we should, we should do about this? Okay, thank you, Aziz. Any last questions on the second paper? The gentleman again at the back. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, I think you may have the, an opportunity to separate um, the price shock on producers and price shock on, on consumer, and including the uh, with with uh, set of countries that you uh, you look at. Right? There, there are countries which are not producing uh, uh, the commodities that uh, there. There are countries which are more or less heavily uh, uh, consuming them. Um, and you, you may be able to use this information to introduce some uh, theoretical constraint in your VAR, which is going to improve a lot the efficiency of the, of the, the, of the, of the estimation, but probably to, to allow you some uh, um, more deeper on, 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 on richer uh, causality uh, uh, analysis based on these theoretical constraints. That's one first remark look at the consumer and producer uh, side of this. Of this. Uh, a second remark is that when you look at price shocks, uh, people like to, uh, to um, consider volatility rather than, uh, than, than levels. Uh, so to, to have a component of volatility in the model, uh, like you do sometimes in arch models, uh, may, may help you to, to see things that you don't see just by looking at prices on their simple variation. Okay, thank you for that, for a very useful uh, distinction. Okay, <clears throat> any last questions? Going, going, go on. Adonai. So thank you for all the useful comments. Now, uh, regarding uh, the price index, what, uh, because there was a lack of time, I couldn't um, explain it very carefully, so I'm going to go, go through it a bit more carefully now. The price index that I've chosen is the Grilly Yang price index, which is compiled by the World Bank. It was actually compiled by two economists working for the World Bank, uh, Green, uh, Grill, uh, Grilly and Yang. And it's been used quite properly ever since. So basically, it's about international commodity prices. And uh, they, they, an index has been created, and it's been deflated by the manufacturing unit value index. So in, in a way, it's like the commodity terms of trade. So it's a very useful index to choose. Of course, there are other comparable indices like the Deaton and Miller index, but I'm, I'm quite familiar with the Grilly and Yang index, so I've just decided to choose it. But in any case, it, they're, they're highly correlated. I mean, there's not really much difference between the two indices. So they've been used quite, um, both of them have been used in the literature, but the Grilly and Yang has been used more than, than the Deaton and Miller uh, index. So they're different indices that, that are used. Um, regarding the second question, which was about uh, the intuition uh, of this uh, price shock, uh, it's, it's about separating a positive shock from a negative shock. So basically, uh, there's, there's a lot of literature on this by Killian uh, in his AER paper, uh, which was published in 2009, and then subsequently he develops that idea even further in his quantitative economics paper in 2011. Uh, so it, it gives a very lucid description of how uh, these uh, uh, censored VARs are created. And uh, the X plus variable is simply an auxiliary variable which separates out the positive from the negative shocks. Now what Killian and Vigfusson argue is that if you just put the positive shock inside it, uh, just censor the variable in that way, then the bias that you are going to introduce into the, into the variable estimate is up to 50%. That is what they show through simulations. So, so that, that, that is why uh, they have proposed this particular model, of this format which uh, we have chosen here. Um, and then about the panel, 
Uh, one reason why I've moved away from the panel is simply the, the argument that I uh, put forward, that um, put, putting, putting this into a panel would not allow me to... Um, f first of all, th there's a difficulty in putting this in a panel because you can't apply this method on a panel framework. It just becomes too complicated. It's a simple bivariate uh, VAR model. I tried to include a third variable, but it just made it just too complicated to analyze. It's just extremely complicated. In its current form, this only works for a bivariate uh, VAR model. Um, and then uh, to Aziz's question, um, what next? Uh, that's a very uh, good question. I have tried to uh, put forward the, 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 the sort of caution. It's just it's the, 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 the conclusion at the moment is more like a caution that the, 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 there are asymmetries uh, in responses to these positive and negative shocks, and these need to be borne in mind. I don't have any solutions as such, but this would be, uh, I think, the subject matter for future research, but uh, a very well poignant uh, remark. And um, finally, uh, Christoph's uh, uh, comments. Yes, uh, it, it is going to be very interesting if I could include uh, exporters and importers. Uh, that would definitely enrich the, the, uh, uh, the study. At the moment, I'm sort of a bit um, tied up with the, with, the, with, with the dimension of the model. So trying to introduce the exporter-importer uh, uh, balance would be a bit difficult, but definitely something to think about, to ponder on, and I'm uh, definitely going to go away thinking about this particular point that you have raised. Regarding the ARCH-type model, which is about volatility, ARCH models are mainly used for high-frequency data. This is uh, annual data. It's a low frequency. So ARCH models work very well when you've got uh, you know, financial data like daily data or, uh, uh, or monthly data. I have seen some uh, uh, estimations where they, they may be used for daily, weekly, or monthly data. I've seen some where they have been applied to quarterly, but it, it is not recommended to use it for yearly data, so I have to sort of stay away from that. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Atanu. So thank you also to the audience, and uh, thank you for the uh, presenters. And uh, at 4 o'clock, we have the uh, final, uh, final panel. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you,